Item number, SCP-226. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-226 is to be kept in a locked cabinet within the site secure item storage unit. Any person wishing to use SCP-226 must have approval from any personnel with at least level 3 security clearance. Description SCP-226 is a cardboard box measuring roughly 30 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 4 centimeters. It has a lid that fits securely over the bottom half, as with any common puzzle box. The surface of the box is a deep black, with the word fear scrawled with white ink on the upper right corner of its lid. Within the box are 1,000 cardboard puzzle pieces, each measuring roughly 2 centimeters in diameter, also considered SCP-226. When completed, the puzzle always forms in a rectangular shape. However, the design and order in which the pieces fit together change with use. SCP-226 aligns itself with whoever initially opens the box. When opened, the pieces change design, and the completed image will show what has been discovered to be the greatest fear of the person who it is aligned to. The image on the pieces do not change after the box has been opened. Recorded images on SCP-226 are as follows. A bloated corpse, sinking underwater. A set of gallows with several nooses attached. A person screaming, with hundreds of small spiders crawling out of his mouth. A darkened window with a mutilated hand scraping across it. SCP-682 A human figure completely covered in various insects, such as bees or centipedes. The cross-section of a coffin buried in dirt, with a person inside, slamming her fists on inside of the lid. When completed and taken back apart, the lid of SCP-226's box will fly through the air and secure itself back on the lower half. The puzzle pieces will disappear, presumably returning back into the box. SCP-226 will then become unaligned and align itself with the next person to open the box. Additional Notes SCP-226 was first discovered by now-defunct Mobile Task Force 12 in 19... At the time, the task force was investigating reports of a possible SCP in a series of tunnels underneath a church in the city of Data Expunged. Due to an equipment malfunction, MTF-12 had lost communication with the surface and was stranded within the tunnels until repairs were made. The task force discovered SCP-226 on a wooden table within a stone room surrounded by several chairs. Believing it to be a simple puzzle, MTF-12 decided to open SCP-226 to pass the time. When depicted, SCP-226 depicted the exact scene of MTF-12 sitting at the table working on a puzzle. However, Agent T appeared to be viciously stabbing several other members of the task force with a standard-issue combat knife. The puzzle was taken apart, transporting back to its box. Repairs were soon made, and MTF-12 returned to the surface. Note, regrettably, an accident en route to the surface caused the death of Agent T. Item Number SCP-232 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-232 is to be kept in a locked safe in the Cognito Hazard Wing of Site-73. When not in use for testing, its batteries are to be removed. When batteries are not installed, SCP-232 may be handled safely by any authorized staff member. The Foundation is to monitor online auction houses and dealers of vintage toys, and acquire any products of the same model as SCP-232 for testing and disposal. Any other instances of SCP-232 discovered are to be archived appropriately. When batteries are installed, personnel other than D-Class are not to handle SCP-232 for any period longer than necessary to install and remove batteries. Staff members who have been exposed to works in the Jack Proton franchise, in any format, are not to handle SCP-232 for any period of time while batteries are installed. D-Class carrying SCP-232 for testing purposes are to be monitored at all times and terminated if SCP-232-related behavior should pose a security risk. The copyright, 
publication, and merchandising rights of the Jack Proton novels and all spin-off media are to be held by Springfield Crown Publishing, a foundation front company, for the purpose of keeping the works out of print, thereby preventing activation of anomalous properties in any SCP-232 instances that may exist outside containment. In the event of any public occurrences of SCP-232 behavior, the Foundation shall liaise with local law enforcement authorities to recover the artifact and issue Class A amnestics to affected parties as appropriate. The Foundation shall encourage world governments to enact extensions to international copyright law as necessary to prevent the Jack Proton franchise from lapsing into the public domain. In the event that any Jack Proton franchise material becomes public domain, DDoS techniques and or mass deployment of Class E amnestics is authorized as appropriate. Description: SCP-232 is a mass-produced children's toy of early 1950s manufacture, composed primarily of tin and a battery-powered electric light apparatus, with an exterior painted to resemble a laser gun of the type featured in popular science fiction of the early 20th century. A hinged section at the base of SCP-232's handle opens to accept two standard AA alkaline batteries. When the batteries have been installed correctly and the trigger is pulled, a small red electric light in the barrel lights up. SCP-232's cognition affecting properties become active. Whenever SCP-232 is picked up and held, or carried by a human being, while it has working batteries installed. Within 5 to 30 seconds of picking up SCP-232, the person handling it will begin speaking in English, regardless of any previous fluency with the language or lack thereof, in a manner resembling the speech patterns of preteen and or adolescent American youth culture, circa 1920 to 1960. Persons so affected will deny that anything is unusual about their manner of speech, and will insist that they have always spoken thusly. This behavior continues until approximately 15 to 20 seconds after the test subject is induced to relinquish possession of SCP-232, after which speech patterns return to normal. In test subjects that have had no exposure to any works from the Jack Proton franchise, SCP-232's effects do not continue past this stage, and the subject retains no memory of their behavior while under its influence. Patent information embossed on the handle of SCP-232 and historical analysis of non-anomalous artifacts identical in appearance indicate that SCP-232 is a mass-produced atomic zapper toy produced by the Corporation from 1953 to 1958 as a licensed merchandising tie-in to Jack Proton, Space Cop, a series of young adult science fiction novels by American author M.K. Snyder. Approximately units were manufactured and sold during the toy's production run, of which an unknown quantity remain in existence today. The Foundation has acquired 138 units since containment of SCP-232 began, all but three of which have shown no anomalous properties under testing. Thorough examination has indicated no discernible differences between anomalous and non-anomalous units. The Jack Proton series consisting primarily of 15 novels and several dozen short stories written between 1940 and Snyder's death in 1973, revolve around the eponymous Major John Patrick Jack Proton, an officer of the Galactic Police Department, in a 27th century setting where the human race has colonized the entirety of the Earth's solar system. The setting is typical of early 20th century juvenile science fiction, and relies heavily on soft sci-fi depictions of space travel, common in literature of the time, including the existence of intelligent life on planets within the solar system, a breathable atmosphere on the moon and other heavenly bodies, faster-than-light travel without relativistic complications, and sapient artificial intelligence and computers based on vacuum tube technology. The novels were additionally adapted into a nationally syndicated radio program from 1947 to 1952 a television series aired by the NBC network from 1953 to 1954, and a black-and-white movie released to theaters in 1956. The Jack Proton franchise bears no demonstrable anomalous properties itself, and may be read, viewed, or listened to safely, provided that the person doing so does not come into contact with SCP-232. In subjects who have previously read, watched, or listened to any installments of the Jack Proton franchise, 
SCP-232 secondary effect begins to manifest after approximately 90 to 120 seconds of physical contact with the toy. During this stage, the test subject's memories and personality are radically altered, to the extent that the subject believes him or herself to be a resident of the fictional 27th century setting of the Jack Proton novels. Test subjects in this stage refuse to answer to their given names, and will, during interviews, describe life stories and career experiences of life in the 27th century, which are internally consistent with themselves and with canonical details about the setting, often describing themselves as close associates of Jack Proton or other major characters featured in the franchise. Polygraph examinations given to test subjects in this state have consistently indicated that the test subjects believe these accounts to be true. In the third and final stage of SCP-232 exposure, occurring approximately 30 to 45 minutes after first contact, test subjects begin to experience severe sensory hallucinations, to the effect that they now perceive the world around them to be the fictional setting of the Jack Proton franchise. In this state, Test subjects almost invariably believe that they are members of Jack Proton's Junior Action Squad and have been assigned a mission of utmost interplanetary security, which researchers and security personnel of the Foundation are involved in, or are attempting to prevent them from completing. Though attempts to neutralize Foundation personnel with SCP-232 have invariably proven futile, test subjects have been noted to resort to physical violence on occasion. Persons affected by the later stages of SCP-232 exposure will resist any attempts to remove SCP-232 from their person and, if separated from it, will attempt to recover it by any means available to them. Effects of the later stages of exposure wear off gradually over a period of approximately three to six hours after SCP-232 is removed from the subject's person. In approximately percent of tests involving long-term exposure, Test subjects have retained memories of their artificial persona after dissipation of the effect, resulting in cognitive dissonance and associated psychological impairments. SCP-232 came to the Foundation's attention following the arrest of a retired steelworker for disorderly conduct, following an affray at a shopping mall. Subject, who insisted on referring to himself as Space Cadet Max Mars, was taken into custody after confronting several mall patrons and brandishing SCP-232, demanding to know the location of the Phobos Ruby, an artifact the theft of which from the Martian Museum of History drives the plot of the novella Murder on the I.O. Express. During debriefing prior to amnestic therapy, subjects stated that he had owned one of the toys as a child and had been a fan of the series, and purchased SCP-232 from an online auction site for nostalgic value because he had had so much fun playing cops and aliens with it in his youth. Interview Logs All interviews conducted by Dr. J. Andrews Test subjects had no exposure to the Jack Proton franchise prior to their acquisition by the Foundation. All interviews conducted three hours after initial exposure to SCP-232. Interview Log 2321 Test Subject D-65203 Caucasian Male 37 years old. Franchise exposure. Six Jack Proton novels. Jack Proton, Space Cop. Jack Proton goes to Mars. All humans must die. The Great Callisto Caper. War in Space. The Night the Lights Went Out in Ganymede. Begin Log. Dr. Andrews. Good afternoon, D65203. How are you today? D-65203. Excuse me, sir? Dr. Andrews. I'm sorry. What is your name? D-65203. Billy, sir. Billy McMercury. Dr. Andrews. You're speaking more politely than usual, Billy. D-65203. Gosh, sir. I wouldn't dare sass off to a real live scientist. Dr. Andrews. I see. How old are you, Billy? D-65203. 14. But that doesn't mean I'm not a real space cop. See? Jack Proton gave me this official space deputy badge himself. D-65203 gestures to the D-Class identification badge pinned to his jumpsuit. Dr. Andrews. I see. Do you work for Jack Proton, then? 
D65203. Golly, sir. I sure do. I'm part of his junior action squad. Dr. Andrews. And what is it that you do for him? D65203. I'm on a super secret mission right now. I'm not sure I'm even supposed to tell you. I better check with him first. Is there a hyperphone in the next room? Dr. Andrews. Where do you believe you are at this moment, Billy? D65203 looks around the interview room, including out a window overlooking the Site 73 parking lot. D65203. Gee, sir, I'm no architect. But judging from the view out the window, this has to be Space Station Delta. D65203 points at a 1989 Buick LeSabre, owned by Dr. Graham. D65203. Say, is that Admiral Jove's flagship docked out there? Please say you'll let me get his autograph. Dr. Andrews. We'll see. End log. Interview log 2322. Test subject. D11503. Caucasian male. 47 years old. Franchise exposure. Six episodes of the Jack Proton Hour radio program encompassing the two-part stories Marooned on Mars, The Prince of Neptune, and A Pioneer's Homecoming. Begin log. Dr. Andrews. Good afternoon. D11503 begins to speak in a monotone robot voice without natural inflection. D11503. Greetings, humanoid. Dr. Andrews. Would you please identify yourself for the record? D11503. I am D-Bot, unit model 11503, at your service. Note. The radio program is the only version of the Jack Proton franchise to feature intelligent robots capable of speech. A robot sidekick originally planned for the television series was scrapped due to budget concerns. Novels published after the radio program was introduced acknowledged the existence of robots but stated that the building of sapient robots had been restricted by the robotic laws instituted by the Space Congress, and none are ever directly introduced to the reader. End note. Dr. Andrews. You're a robot, you say. You look very lifelike. D11503. I was programmed to appease humanoid sensibilities. Dr. Andrews. And how old are you? D11503. I was activated at the Advanced Robotics Facility in Old New Hampshire on Earth on January 12th, 2592. Dr. Andrews. What is your purpose? D11503. I am a fully modular service robot. My purpose is to assist Major John Patrick Proton of the Galactic Police Department in the apprehension of dangerous criminals. Dr. Andrews. When you say you're fully modular, what does that entail? D11503. My body has been designed to make use of a wide variety of customizable limbs. I may remove my factory installed appendages at will and replace them with those designed for specific purposes. Dr. Andrews. Could you please demonstrate now by removing your left arm? D11503. Affirmative. D11503 grabs his left arm at the shoulder with his right hand and attempts, unsuccessfully, to remove it by unscrewing it from its socket. D11503, I seem to be experiencing a malfunction. Please refer to my operating manual for information on how to resolve this difficulty. Dr. Andrews, never mind, D-Bot. Are you capable of solving logic problems? D11503, I am programmed to answer any and all queries directed to me. Dr. Andrews. A man has been sentenced to death. The morning of his execution, the executioner tells the condemned man he is to be either hanged or drowned, and tells the man to ask him one yes or no question, which he is compelled to answer truthfully. If the answer to the question is yes, then the man will be hanged. If the answer is no, then the man will be drowned. The man asks, are you going to drown me? Will the man be hanged or will he be drowned? D11503 is silent for 38 seconds. Dr. Andrews. D-Bot? D11503. Error. Error. Dr. Andrews. 
I beg your pardon? D11503. If answer equals no, then result equals drowning. But no equals incorrect if result equals drowning. Therefore, drowning equals impossible. Result equals hanging. Hanging equals impossible if answer equals no. Error. Error. Does not compute. System overload. System overload. Consult operator's manual for... D11503 slumps over and ceases responding to outside stimuli. End log. Interview log 2323. Test subject. D67539. Caucasian female. 26 years old. Franchise exposure. One short story collection. Starship Days. One unauthorized fan fiction short story. Major Sarah. Forward. None of the official Jack Proton stories feature female characters as protagonists or action-oriented supporting characters. Prior to Interview 2323, all experiments with female test subjects had resulted in the subject developing the personality of a damsel in distress or innocent bystander persona. Major Sarah, an unauthorized piece of short fiction published in 1972 by the fanzine Junior Action Squad which details the experience of the first woman to join the Galactic Police Department and her subsequent forbidden love affair with Jack Proton, was introduced in order to determine whether third-party fiction set in the Jack Proton universe would have an impact on the results of exposure. Begin log. Dr. Andrews. Good morning. D67539. Sir. Good morning, sir. D69539 rises to her feet and salutes. Dr. Andrews returns the salute. Dr. Andrews, as you were, please state your name for the record. D-67539. Sir, Lieutenant First Class Samantha Marie von Saturnberg, sir. Dr. Andrews, no need to be so formal, Lieutenant. Please relax. D-67539. Sir, I didn't get where I am today by relaxing, sir. Dr. Andrews, I'm not an officer. You don't need to call me sir. D-67539 pauses. D-67539. Sir, I... Yes, sir. Yes. Dr. Andrews. You mentioned getting where you are today. Where is that? D-67539. I'm currently the youngest officer in the Galactic Police Department. Dr. Andrews. How old are you? D-67539. 17. Dr. Andrews, you were commissioned at 17. D-67539, not bad for a girl, huh? Dr. Andrews, why did they accept you so young? D-67539, because I wasn't wasting my time wearing frilly dresses and playing with dolls, that's why. Dr. Andrews, you must have been very goal-oriented to make it so young. Why did you want to be a space cop so badly? D-67539. To work with Jack Proton, of course. Dr. Andrews. Why him, specifically? D-67539. Because he's the best there is. He's smart, and he's strong, and can I tell you a secret? Dr. Andrews. Everything we discuss here is strictly confidential, Lieutenant. D-67539. Well, he's dreamy. Dr. Andrews. Dreamy? D-67539. Those beautiful blue eyes, that rock-solid jaw, those bulging biceps. Can't you just imagine him holding your hand on the walk home, sharing a malt with you at the drugstore, dancing close together at the spring formal? Dr. Andrews. I can't say it had occurred to me. D-67539. I just have to meet him. I'll introduce myself and he'll be so impressed by how much I've accomplished, and we'll talk about work, and spaceball, and music, and maybe he'll ask if I'll go with him for dinner or a movie at the Hover Inn. Wouldn't that be a dream come true? I'll wear my hair down and put on my prettiest dress, I mean, uh, I don't wear dresses like some little girl obsessed with princesses and space ponies, but that doesn't mean I can't wear a dress for him. I bet he loves a girl who knows how to dress up. Item number, SCP-258. Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures 
SCP-258 is to be kept in a standard storage vault with a keycard lock to be accessed only on approval from the supervisor of Site-15. SCP-258 is to be stored in a 2 meter by 2 meter basin, which is to be emptied twice a week by approved D-Class personnel. All personnel interacting with SCP-258 are to be rotated no less than twice a month. While using SCP-258 is not directly harmful in any way, all who have utilized it have expressed a desire to do so again, ranging from the wistful to the vehement. All personnel interacting with SCP-258 are to be screened for underlying mental instability. After Incident 2581, cleaning personnel are to be issued light hazmat suits while interacting with SCP-258. Description SCP-258 was recovered from Maine after parents of local school children reported that stories of a sad, bouncy frog their children had been spreading were true. Agent F confirmed the nature of the object, and Foundation personnel replaced it with a replica without incident. SCP-258 appears to be a simple, bouncing playground rider, seemingly designed to fit children of elementary school age and shaped like a stylized green frog with rotating handles on either side of its head. SCP-258 has milky white eyes with what appear to be streams of white paint running down its face, as though it were weeping. Numerous attempts have been made to remove this substance from SCP-258. The green paint comes off with normal paint removal techniques, but the white substance, hereafter designated SCP-2581, cannot. It only fades with time observed to depend on various factors, including length of time utilized, and the extent of the emotional burden relieved. SCP-258 constantly appears to weep streams of SCP-2581 at a constant rate of approximately 0.12 liters per hour. When a subject sits on SCP-258, grasps its handles, and begins rocking back and forth, they report that a feeling of peace and contentment washes over them. The eyes of the object then begin leaking SCP-2581 at an accelerated rate, relative to the effect it has on its user's state of mind. Though this substance cannot be removed from SCP-258 once the seat is vacated, it remains in liquid form during use, and will drip from the object onto the ground. Testing of this material afterward has determined it to be a mixture of plain white paint human tears, and skin secretions of the American bullfrog. How SCP-258 generates SCP-2581 is unknown. The direct effect of SCP-258 only lasts for as long as the subject remains seated, though several subjects suffering symptoms of chronic depression have reported a lasting positive effect, resulting from some insight they gained while riding SCP-258. Repeated use of SCP-258 by a subject has shown to be mildly addictive, and Agent W had to be restrained and struck before regaining self-control. The results of allowing mentally unstable subjects access to SCP-258 is unknown, pending further testing, though it is likely that any subject suffering from severe depressive symptoms would cause SCP-258 to produce uncontrollable amounts of SCP-2581. Addendum 2581. After D-3354 committed suicide following repeated skin contact with SCP-2581, the direct effects of contact with the substance were re-examined. Continuous skin contact with the fluid appears to transfer some of the emotions suppressed during use of the SCP, and the prior user was re-evaluated, revealing she was recovering from data expunged. Item Number SCP-282 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-282 should be kept in a containment locker, outfitted with a standard array of explosive, chemical, biological, and mimetic high-level defenses. Personnel entering SCP-282's containment must be verified with a retinal scanner, and no experimentation sessions lasting longer than three hours are permitted. Description SCP-282 is a children's toy. Recovered from the truck atoll in Micronesia, SCP-282 is in the shape of a set of devil or juggling sticks, apparently made from locally available materials. Historical and cultural sources show that SCP-282 was originally used by natives of its island of origin 
as part of an elaborate annual ritual known as literally translated as he moves to bring good luck for the following year. Numerous anomalies on the island alerted the foundation to SCP-282's presence, including exceptionally long harvest seasons, several unknown species of fruit growing locally, and reports by missionaries of strange lights and noises, and packs of children who appeared identical. Full research on SCP-282's properties is pending. Addendum 282A Cleanup operations in the truck atoll have recovered large amounts of information, including a nearly complete set of use instructions for SCP-282. Operations in the atoll will be reduced, and despite apprehension from teams assisting in recovery of SCP-282, full testing as to whether anomalous properties can be recreated will continue. Addendum 282B Personnel of Level 4 or above may view Incident Report 282-CB as of any attempts to recreate the effects of SCP-282 are punishable by termination. All remaining information is to be classified. Data expunged. Addendum 282-C Materials seized from a residence on the truck atoll resembled an incomplete replica of SCP-282. As the replica, seemingly in the process of creation, demonstrates no anomalous properties, it has been added to SCP-282's containment until such a time as we can ascertain its nature. Foundation-operated coercion revealed little information as to how or why it was created, but did indicate that more civilians in the area of recovery may know how or be interested in creating similar replicas. Whether the recovered replica is identical to SCP-282 is unknown. Incident Report 282-CB Personal Log of Dr. J. Garrison Date Undisclosed Attempts to recreate the ritual described in documents 2A214 through 17 are slow going, mostly due to the exhausting requirements of using SCP-282. First of all, it took us half a week to find anyone at the site who can actually use juggling sticks. For reference, researcher M. Munoz, a medical technology analyst, was ultimately chosen as the subject. Second, SCP-282 are apparently very difficult to use compared to ordinary juggling sticks, so we had to spend a few weeks working on that. Third, and most persistent and annoyingly, the instructions we have call for the subject to juggle with SCP-282 constantly for 36 hours, with a low rate of error and no dropping the stick. And that's the reason it's taken us two months so far. They can talk about dedication and project funding and results, but the stamina required is damn near superhuman. It's been suggested that we apply an intravenous drip of caffeine and electrolytes to maintain alertness, and I'm willing to try that. Hour Zero Subject stands in a 10 meter by 10 meter blast chamber that has been prepared according to recovered instructions. Among other preparations, subject stands in the center of a 1.5 meter diameter circle marked with native flowers, with a goat's head at the interior point. Surrounding this circle is a 3-meter circle marked with a mixture of goat and chicken entrails, mashed by hand with wooden implements. Outside of this is a final 3.5-meter circle marked with chicken feathers, chicken and goat footprints and ash, and a poultice of several herbs and human blood. One chicken skeleton and one goat skeleton have been laid around the room, outside the perimeter of the final circle. The subject, medical technician M. Munoz, with attached intravenous drip, stands in the center with SCP-282. Subject begins to use SCP-282. Hour 1. Subject continues with no major errors in play or reports of anomalies. Vital signs are all normal. Six hours already. He hasn't dropped it yet. I'm very hopeful that this time will be it. I watch through the plate glass, get nervous every time he fumbles. Every time. It's gotten a little ridiculous. I'm worried it might be an effect of the SCP, so I told the standing guard, but I think it's more stress than a mental pull. Going to call a secondary observer in and sleep on the cot in here. Woke up. He's still going. Note. Instruments and testing chambers showed that subject's heart rate had increased slightly by this point in time. Hour 18. Subject notes sounds of laughter from inside the testing chamber. Outside observer notes nothing abnormal. 
Hour 23. Subject becomes increasingly paranoid, claiming that the experiment won't work and asking if he can stop. Encouraged to continue juggling, and at no point does the subject drop the stick. Hypothesized to be a stress reaction. Hour 26. Subject claims to feel a breeze in the chamber. Signs of strong winds are apparent when animal skeletons outside the circles are moved as if being blown. However, none of the flowers in the first circle are disturbed, nor is subject's play impaired. Hour 27. All lights in chamber abruptly dim. In addition, the outer circle appears to completely and suddenly disappear from view. Signs of wind, despite the enclosed and subterranean nature of the blast chamber, have increased. Subject is encouraged to continue juggling. Note: Later records show no electrical issues with chamber lights, hypothesized to be an effect of the SCP. Hour 30. Subject reports feeling cold. Sensors affirm that the temperature inside the chamber has dropped 20 degrees. Continues juggling. I nearly can't believe he's kept it moving this long. Obviously, the error frequency was expected to go up as the time goes longer, but he hasn't dropped it once and the error rate seems to have decreased, like it's getting ingrained. Here comes the final stretch. Looks tired. I don't blame him. Hour 32. Second circle moves as if being blown inwards, then disappears entirely. Subject makes no note of this. After 10 minutes, animal skeletons around the perimeter of the chamber stand up, despite lack of muscle or connective tissue. Subject becomes unresponsive, muttering quietly. Hour 33. Final circle disappears, and lights dim again, until area inside chamber is completely dark. Observers note a voice exclaiming, He moves, before sounds of juggling cease, and a clattering noise is heard. Class 2 lockdown is ordered. Note. Further analysis through infrared camera reveals that at hour 3314, the subject's knees buckle and after muttering loudly before footage is interrupted by several bright flashes, apparently only visible to infrared sensors. During this time, subject disappears entirely, and SCP-282 falls to the ground. Hour 34. Sounds of juggling resume from inside the chamber. Note: Infrared cameras show that a figure not corresponding to M. Munoz appeared in the testing chamber, recovered SCP-282 from the floor, and continued juggling while laughing quietly. Hour 35. Several more infrared flashes occur, some of which now translate into flashes in the visible spectrum. Containment chamber is very dark. At 3528 hours, side of containment chamber is ruptured by a sudden heat, measuring over degrees Celsius. Camera footage shows the unknown force proceeding to destroy obstacles in its path via obliteration moving up an emergency stairwell, damaging stairwell but without compromising it structurally. At ground level, it proceeds to carve a route through the facility until the perimeter of site is reached, at which point it is no longer seen. All of the above take place within 4.7 seconds. Nearby personnel report seeing only a bright hot light. Note: Camera footage shows that upon compromising the perimeter of the facility, the force paused for several milliseconds, then disappeared, as opposed to exiting the facility. Infrared footage from the testing chamber shows that it is completely empty at this time. Within several seconds, light in testing chamber returns to normal. Subject has returned to testing chamber, collapsed on the floor, with SCP-282 nearby as if dropped. In addition, a fine layer of ash covers the testing room floor. Paramedic teams rush in. Subject is currently undergoing treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder and is expected to resume normal operations shortly. After Action Report From interview with Subject M. Munoz I'm... I'm juggling, right? Like I've been doing for the last... hell... whole day. Then everything picks up like I'm standing in a hurricane and I feel this... thing. Don't even know what it is, but it was there and I could... Christ. Everything went black and I knew that I had moved, that I was somewhere else, because I knew there wasn't a floor or ceiling or those goddamn sticks where I was. Just nothing, really, and the darkness. And then it was there. God damn it. I knew it, that there was something else there, even though I couldn't see or hear or feel it, 
because there was nothing to see or hear or feel. It was just waiting there, keeping me there, waiting for me to do something. I curled up in this little ball, tried to make it not notice me, but it was there breathing down my neck the whole time. In the end, I just told it I wanted to leave. That was it. Additional data. Over and property damage was caused by incident 282 CB and containment of three separate SCPs were compromised. Because of this, current sanctions on experimentation with SCP-282 were put in place. Item Number SCP-297 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-297 is to be kept in a standard lockbox at Site-19's High Value Item Storage Facility. Standard positive action defenses, explosive, chemical, biological, and mimetic, are to be in place at all times, according to standard operating procedure. Personnel wishing to utilize SCP-297 for experimental or field purposes must fill out a Form 32 and submit it to the Head of Research and Containment. Description SCP-297 is a transparent plastic vibrator. Approximately 30 centimeters in length, 5 centimeters in width. Examination has determined that the internal structure has been heavily altered, and that the standard 6 volt power supply has been converted into what appears to be a micronized nuclear reactor, powered by a small quantity of plutonium. In addition, the standard power intensity controls have been altered from the normal on off switch with secondary intensity dial to a single 5 stage selector switch. The bottom four intensity levels, off, low, medium, high, appear to be within normal parameters for such a device and can be used safely for such purposes if so desired. When turned to the highest intensity setting, labeled suicide, SCP-297's vibration frequency swiftly increases to upwards of 200,000 kilohertz. If the upper portion of the device is touched to any solid material, SCP-297 will change frequency to one that causes a positive harmonic feedback loop in the object, causing the object to lose cohesion within 60 seconds of continual contact. This invariably kills organisms that it is exposed to. Experimentation has determined that SCP-297 can disintegrate a 1 meter cube of concrete into powder within 10 seconds. The time required for other objects varies, based on the density and harmonic properties of the material. Due to the similarities between the effects of SCP-297 and SCP-1012, investigation into whether both effects are variations of the same phenomena are ongoing. Addendum Circumstances of Retrieval SCP-297 was retrieved from the third basement of the parking structure of a 30-story apartment building in Los Angeles, California. On According to eyewitnesses, the device bored a vertical hole through the entire building's northwestern corner, starting from the 30th floor and proceeding, floor by floor, through the entire structure, until a maintenance worker neutralized the device by turning it off. All witnesses were detained and administered Class A amnestics, and the device was retrieved by Foundation personnel. A large quantity of organic slurry, later identified as a liquefied human body, was found on the 30th floor, at the upper limit of the damage. Item Number SCP-309 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-309 is currently stored in a secure glove box in the Level 2 Research Lab at Site- Routine physical examinations of SCP-309, as well as experiments involving small animals, may only be conducted using the glove box. Removal of SCP-309 from the glove box for testing on larger animals or humans requires the approval of Dr. or equivalent Level 4 Command personnel. Human testing is restricted to D-Class personnel. Description SCP-309 is a small, plush, stuffed animal that looks as if it has been turned completely inside out. Golden orange fur is present along the seams, while a small amount of cotton stuffing and two protruding eyes are visible on the head. The interior of SCP-309 is understuffed with cotton, 
giving it a flexible and cuddly feel. SCP-309 has no effect on inanimate objects. However, contact with living subjects is both dangerous and life-threatening. Humans and animals lightly brushing SCP-309 with a finger or a similarly small portion of the body display severe, non-localized discomfort for tens of minutes afterward. Humans also report feeling extreme nausea, despite the fact that SCP-309 does not induce vomiting. The discomfort and nausea are so overwhelming that even the most hardened subjects have proven unable to voluntarily maintain contact with SCP-309 for longer than a few seconds. If SCP-309 is pressed firmly against a subject, or the subject quickly picks up SCP-309 and attempts to hold it, the subject will be violently and painfully turned inside out over the course of 5 to 10 seconds. Skeletons are unaltered, but all soft tissues are inverted, such that muscles, tendons, ligaments, and various internal organs are resituated on the exterior of the body. Though not immediately fatal, the process is irreversible and universally considered painful. Item Number SCP-345 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-345 is to be kept inside a secure vault at site Seeing as the object is inert by itself, no further containment is necessary. Personnel seeking to solve SCP-345 need the permission of one level 2 personnel. SCP-345-1 is to be kept inside a 5 meter by 5 meter by 5 meter sealed room on site. Following Incident 3451, personnel are only allowed to solve one of the six faces of SCP-345. Trying to solve all faces will result in reassignment to MTF Epsilon 8, the Midwives. Description SCP-345 is a stone cube whose faces are each divided into nine squares of equal size, and sections of which can be rotated in a fashion similar to a common puzzle toy. Each face of the cube measures 5.7 centimeters. Instead of the normal six colors commonly found in this kind of puzzle, the squares represent six different materials, an intrusive magmatic rock resembling granite, an intrusive magmatic rock resembling gabbro, an extrusive magmatic rock resembling basalt, a sedimentary rock resembling sandstone, volcanic glass resembling obsidian, and a high-grade metamorphic rock resembling granite gneiss. SCP-345 can be opened by forcibly pulling its sides apart. The cube is hollow possessing a circular cavity 4.5 centimeters in diameter in its center. If left open for 5 seconds, SCP-345 will automatically close and shuffle itself for 2 minutes. Afterward, it may be safely handled. Note that it will not be possible to force SCP-345 open after the shuffling takes place. Solving SCP-345 is no harder than solving the common versions of the puzzle. However, if one of the faces becomes complete, one of the following situations may occur. If the completed face represents one of the magmatic rocks, SCP-345 will heat up to approximately either 1500 degrees Celsius, gabbro face, 1200 degrees Celsius, basalt face, or 900 degrees Celsius, granite face. The amount of time SCP-345 takes to cool down also greatly varies with the basalt face being the fastest, up to 50 minutes, and the gabbro face being the slowest, up to 250 days. If the completed face represents the sedimentary rock, the cube will start shaking violently for up to 10 hours. The sound of either water running or wind howling can be heard coming from inside SCP-345 during the whole process. If the completed face represents volcanic glass, SCP-345 will heat up to approximately 900 degrees Celsius and will take up to 5 minutes to cool down. If the completed face represents the metamorphic rock, SCP-345 will suffer the same process that would happen if the granite face was completed. After cooling down, the cube will proceed to shuffle itself at high speeds, making loud grinding sounds while it does so for up to 50 hours. After one of the processes is over, 
SCP-345 can be opened again, and a sculpture made of the same material that was represented by the completed face can be found inside of it. The small sculpture will always be of a planet or planetoid 4.5 centimeters in diameter. These sculptures do not resemble any currently known planet. If more than one face is completed at the same time, both corresponding processes will occur, one followed by the other. The statue created will be made of both materials. For instance, the sculpture created by completing the granite and obsidian faces at the same time had its continents made of granite and its oceans made of obsidian. SCP-345 was recovered by a Foundation agent on date undisclosed, days after the eruption of the volcano in Ecuador. Said agent claims to have found it near the base of the volcano and took it as a curiosity. He learned about the true nature of the SCP after trying to solve it, suffering third-degree burns in the process. Incident 3451 On date undisclosed, while Dr. tested SCP-345, she managed to complete all faces by not opening the cube once a face was completed. SCP-345 proceeded to rumble for three minutes, after which it opened by itself. A small metal sphere, 4.5 centimeters in diameter, emerged from inside SCP-345 and hovered three meters from the ground. Shortly after, the sphere began rotating accelerating to a rate of 5 meters a second. Strong gravitational forces were detected in the vicinity of the sphere, visibly affecting objects up to 15 meters away. Seconds later, a dense orange liquid with an average surface temperature of approximately 4,000 degrees Celsius began flowing from SCP-345, which proceeded to encompass the metal sphere. Afterward, another, denser liquid began flowing out of SCP-345. It also proceeded to encircle the sphere. This liquid continued to flow from inside SCP-345 until the sphere reached a diameter of 2.3 meters, at which point the flow stopped and SCP-345 automatically closed. The resulting sphere was still slowly spinning and hovering above the ground. It was extremely dense, and its gravitational pull was strong enough to severely damage its surroundings. The temperature at the surface varied between 900 and 1600 degrees Celsius. 30 minutes later, parts of the outermost magma began to cool down, solidifying into a thin rock crust. 20 hours later, most parts of the sphere were solid rock, with small seas of lava flowing between them. Little volcanoes and mountains could also be observed. At this point, a special containment team with heat-resistant equipment was moved in to relocate the sphere to a safer room. The sphere was later designated SCP-3451. Studies regarding the probability of its eventual development of an atmosphere are underway. Note: Although at first we thought that SCP-345 had created a copy of Earth, as of date undisclosed, studies have shown that it is unlikely that SCP-3451 will develop an atmosphere and the composition of its magma is very different from Earth's, containing far smaller quantities of silica and aluminum, and larger amounts of titanium. It is currently unknown if the magma of other planetoids created by SCP-345 would have a similar composition. Perhaps we should have a D-Class complete it, preferably on an open field. Dr. Item Number SCP-365 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-365 is to be kept in its testing pool at all times. The door to the pool is to be locked and guarded by one security guard. Experiment requests must be approved by a Level 3 researcher. Description SCP-365 is a green pool noodle made of polyethylene foam. By itself, it displays no unusual properties and is physically identical to a typical noodle of similar size. SCP-365's unusual properties manifest only when it is placed in a body of water. When a subject completely submerges in said body of water, they become unable to get out. Subjects report a sense of dread and describe themselves in an infinite sea, swimming endlessly in a direction and finding only more water. It is important to note that to outside observers, the subject simply seems to be flailing in place. 
The only way to remove a submerged person from the water is to remove SCP-365, negating its effects. All other methods of rescue have failed. Cables and ropes have exhibited an unnatural resistance and snapped. Drainage systems have failed, and human intervention has led to data expunged. Addendum 3651 SCP-365 was discovered in on date undisclosed. Retrieval personnel found it at the public pool, along with the bodies of several civilians. Because SCP-365's properties were unknown at the time, agents lost their lives. SCP-365 was eventually found and removed from the pool, and carbon monoxide from an improperly maintained water heater was used as a cover story. Addendum 3652 On date undisclosed, researcher discovered that Hallway 19 of Storage Site 23 was flooded. Said researcher noticed water leaking from SCP-365's storage locker at a rate of 5 liters per minute. She quickly notified Dr. who opened the locker to find SCP-365 producing water from its holes. SCP-365 was subsequently moved to its testing pool, whereupon the flow of water stopped. SCP-365's containment procedures have been changed accordingly. Item Number SCP-385 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-385 is locked within a standard fireproof container at Storage Site-23. Experimentation with SCP-385 requires written approval from any Level 4 researcher. After the incident outlined in Report 385-C, all further testing must take place in a facility located within 5 degrees of either of the Earth's poles. Description SCP-385 is a waste-mounted harness, crafted from heavily antiquated leather and brass. A curled electrical cord connects a handheld push-button switch to the mechanism mounted on the front of the harness, which itself contains a superfluous set of interlocking gears and colored LED light bulbs. The harness has sustained significant impact damage. A damaged engraving on the front of the mechanism reads, Special Edition. Three of Illegible and Illegible by The Factory. Also retrieved with SCP-385 were a cardboard storage box and instruction manual. Both the box and manual feature a retro art style, reminiscent of 1950s science fiction pulp illustrations. The manual describes the harness as a personal anti-gravity field generator and contains simple illustrations in the proper use of the device. When operated according to instructions, SCP-385 does create an energy field that counteracts the influence of outside gravitational forces upon the device and an individual wearing or holding it, as well as neutralizing their inertia. Measurements of velocity and direction with high-speed video cameras tentatively indicate that inertia is neutralized relative to the sun as the inertial frame of reference. Research to duplicate this effect is ongoing, but the mechanical components of the device appear to be non-functional. The harness will still produce the anti-gravity effect even when all mechanical components beyond the activation switch are removed. Addendum Except under strictly controlled conditions, use of this device is invariably fatal due to the speed of the Earth's rotation and revolution around the Sun. An individual removed from both the Earth's gravitational pull and momentum would either be flung into space or experience a fatal collision with an object blocking their trajectory, which will at least result in the device's deactivation to allow for retrieval. SCP-385 was recovered from the room of a 13-year-old boy in shortly after what appears to be its first activation. It is unknown how many other SCP-385 mechanisms may still be at large or how large the production run was. Interviewing the deceased boy's parents traced SCP-385 to a downtown antique toy store where the device was purchased as a novelty. The store was found to be abandoned and had not been occupied for some time. Downtown residents do not remember the shop ever being open. Item Number SCP-387 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures 
Due to the nature of this object and the almost non-existent harm it poses, it is stationed in a storage container in Site-19 with a standard lock. The red tub in which SCP-387 is contained does not possess any unusual properties itself, as has been determined through testing, but SCP-387 will not duplicate itself unless at least a layer of it covers the bottom of the aforementioned container. A sheet is available for those wishing to utilize SCP-387, and access will be revoked if it is not properly restored. Description SCP-387 is a tub of commercially available LEGO, normal in design. Irregular shapes not featured in normal sets, such as circular wheels and prisms, are also available. It has no brand name, and every company interviewed by undercover agents thus far has denied ever making irregular LEGO. When the tub is not full, i.e. when it is partially or almost fully emptied, the LEGO will slowly duplicate themselves, stopping when the container is full. The interesting property of SCP-387 is that, when constructed by a human hand, see Addendum 387-D, the constructions will animate themselves, performing activities based on their surroundings. For example, if a LEGO man, which is a man constructed using the provided humanoid parts, is placed within a car, it will begin to drive it. Further experimentation has revealed that the car, and indeed any complex machine, needs no internal engine or power source. The LEGO people have some form of sentience, as they interact with each other quite readily. If left over time, the constructed people in buildings will evolve. They will take on occupations based on the buildings around them. For example, some people will become firemen and use fire trucks if the corresponding objects are there. They will also use SCP-387 to construct more things to expand their society. Humans can interact with them quite peacefully, but if a human becomes hostile to them, they will immediately cease all activity and become inanimate. SCP-387 was found in February of 2000 by Agent H. During a long train ride back to the city he lived in, Agent H idly constructed a man from SCP-387, which was in the seat beside him at the time. Several seconds later, it became animated. Agent H quickly disassembled the man and delivered the item to Site-19 for analysis, where it now remains. The security tapes from the train were confiscated and destroyed before they could be reviewed. Optional Information SCP-387 should not be given to children under the age of 10, especially if the aforementioned children are influenced by cartoons and television shows. Experiment 387A A small community of SCP-387 is formed in a testing chamber. A plane constructed from normal LEGO was placed to the side of the community. Over the next three hours, the following changes were observed. Several LEGO men procured some equipment from SCP-387, heading over towards the plane. With incredible efficiency, the LEGO men constructed what was, for all intents and purposes, a working airport, the specific pieces having been supplied by SCP-387 without visible signal. A petrol tank zoomed over to said plane, apparently filled it with fuel, despite earlier observations that vehicles constructed from SCP-387 do not require fuel, and the plane proceeded to literally take off, flying around the room at low speeds and altitude, seemingly to avoid crashing. More planes, of different make and design, were formed soon after. Addendum 3871 Judging by this, I'd say that constructions of SCP-387 have some form of understanding of the surrounding environment, and they are able to convert existing LEGO to 387. Dr. Arch Experiment 387-B Several young children were given SCP-387 and were given instructions to use their imagination. The children, who had their memories of this experiment removed, began constructing various objects. After having noticed that they were animate, they excitedly conferred, and began building several objects that they intended to use in battling each other. These included a transformer, an M1 Abrams tank, and several expunged. The children were instantly removed, at which point, the creations began to fire, 
and eventually destroyed each other, though not after considerable effort. Addendum 3872 How the fuck did these children gain knowledge of the workings of an M1 Abrams tank? No less expunged. I'm not responsible for cleaning out the mess those things make. If anyone is stupid enough to let children go at SCP-387, I am not recommending an upgrade to Euclid, as the constructions did not fire whilst in the presence of humans. This has been tested with adults, and proved just as correct. Dr. Arch Experiment 387-C The red tub that contains SCP-387 is emptied of Lego. Commercially available Lego is then placed in the tub for a minute. Constructed objects are inanimate, and remain so. SCP-387 replaced. It is noted that the Lego placed within the tub also did not duplicate itself. Experiment 387-C2 A single block of SCP-387 is placed within the red tub. It does not replicate. More of SCP-387 is added until the bottom layer is covered, at which point it began to replicate itself quite rapidly until it had been filled. The amount of SCP-387 removed from the tub continued to work. Similarly, when an amount of SCP-387 higher than the tub's capacity was placed upon the tub, it shrank until the red tub was fully filled. Addendum 3873 It appears that the red tub itself has no abilities by itself, but SCP-387 will not duplicate itself unless in that particular tub. Perhaps this is a copyright mechanism that stops copies of 387 being made. Further experimentation needed. Dr. Arch Experiment 387-D A robotic arm was used to construct a car out of 387. It did not animate. This test was repeated with a human hand, at which point the car animated as usual. A dead hand from a recently dismembered agent was used, to no response. The hand was then heated, which still provoked no response. Addendum 3874 It appears that 387 responds to a pulse or some other detection of human life. Dr. Arch Addendum 3875 This SCP has been in high demand for extended use, as further testing has revealed no more anomalies or features. In the personnel tested, SCP-387 has improved morale and attitude by 87%. People are really kids at heart here. As such, I'm recommending that all personnel be given free access for recreational use. Dr. Arch Request Approved Experiment 387-E Once a normal community of 387 was constructed, a small mound of Mega Blocks, a common copy of LEGO, was placed near the community. When this happened, everything constructed of 387 stopped moving, turned slowly towards the Mega Blocks, and expunged. Addendum 3876 Jesus f***ing Christ. Dr. Arch Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.